Thank you very much for joining this session and thank you to the conference organisers for inviting me to speak today. My name is Liz Jukas and I shall be speaking on behalf of a wide network of individuals who've been helping to build worldwide radiology. And I'd like to share with you a little bit of our experience on um, how we approach trying to help build imaging capacity in low resource health systems. Now the challenges that patients in the world face and the potential solutions vary so widely that obviously no one size fits all. So the way I'm going to do this is that I will give a brief overview of the um, current situation and then focus on some of the solutions that we are working on with our partners. So this is an image from the Medical Imaging and Nuclear Medicine Lancet Oncology Commission report. And it describes a lot of work on trying to actually quantify the situation at the moment. And this one image, I think, conveys a very important message. This shows you the number of radiologists per million inhabitants. And you can see that in very large parts of the world, the light yellow, for example, there are fewer than 10 radiologists per million people. Compare that to the dark green areas of the world where there are a hundred or more. And of course, if you have a lack of radiologists, then you have a lack of allied health professions, you have absence of equipment, and very importantly, you don't have a voice that speaks on behalf of the importance of imaging for patient care. Then another report that I think is really helpful uh, has come out recently and, and you might wish to read that if you're interested in this topic and want to learn a bit more. This is a report that is about diagnostics um, more broadly, not just imaging, but it does assess ultrasound and imaging services. And what it does is that on the left hand side, it shows you the median availability of diagnostics. So Red is very little or no availability, and blue is good availability. Along the bottom, you see the different kinds of tests they look at, and at the top, the level of healthcare provision. And then along the right-hand side, a number of countries for which this data was collected. And what you can see, if we just focus on hospitals, where we would expect imaging services to be present, that when it comes to X-ray and ultrasound, the majority of hospitals have a provision that hovers around the 30 to 70 percent mark. So there is a large number of places where even X-ray and ultrasound are not available or not functioning. And when it comes to CT scanning, you can see that it's it's very, very, very low. So I think this highlights the situation when it comes to human resources and service capacity, equipment capacity. But another really important thing that we need to think about when we're thinking of access to imaging tests is whether a patient can actually afford, afford a test. So this is a really poignant paper, I think. The WHO has a guideline that says if a patient is suspected of having tuberculosis and they are smear negative, their sputum is negative, then the next step to consider is a chest x-ray. These, in this paper, they looked at whether or not a patient can actually afford to have that chest x-ray. And you can see that in some parts of the world, x-rays are free of charge, but in others, people actually have to pay out of their own pocket, cash in hand, to have that x-ray. So even if they live within travel distance of a clinic that will provide that and has a functioning service, they will not be able to access it because they don't have the money to do that. So affordability for the patient is also something that we really need to think about very hard. We should not just focus on you know, improving the existing equipment and, and service and training, but we need to really think about how does the patient actually get into this service. So this is just the broader sort of situation, and you can see it's, it's a huge challenge. This is a challenge that needs to be solved at policy level, national level, international level. It, it'll need lots of investment. And those two reports that I've mentioned 
give a really good insight into the kind of investment and also the benefits that those investments will bring. And the reason we have to do it is because we have also all signed up to the Sustainable Development Goals. And goal number three is about ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being for all at all ages. And imaging has to be a part of that. Whether it's an x-ray for TB screening, as you can see here, whether it's antenatal ultrasound or whether it's trauma care, road traffic injuries are a major, major cause of death and morbidity. And dealing with trauma patients requires investment in imaging. So this is a big problem and a small organisation like ours is not going to move the needle. But meanwhile, there is a need on the ground and there are many people who who are asking for support and there are many people who are interested in providing that support. So Worldwide Radiology came into existence in the UK in the idea that we try and bring together the, that demand and that opportunity. So this is an image that I took straight from our strategic plan. And what I'd like to highlight here is that the way we are approaching this is by providing clinical and diagnostic support education and training and also supporting research and advocacy and I think those elements are really important because this problem is enormous and we realize that we need to do stuff but there is actually very little evidence on which test is the best for which situation which implementation works best what should we prioritize there is a great need for further research I'm not going to talk about that any further, but I did want to highlight that. So we have three key work streams, really. One of the first one is point of care ultrasound, and I'll talk a little bit more about that now. And the others are in-country radiology support. And by radiology, I mean anything that helps radiology service provision. So that's technicians, that's sonographers, that's you know the whole thing that provides radiology service. And then there is the remote support element. So first of all, to focus on the Ghana Focus Partnership. Um, this is a slide that I borrowed from Dr. Mamade, who is a Ghanaian emergency medicine physician. And you can see her presenting this slide recently to the European Society of Emergency Medicine. And the reason I like this slide so much is because it brings together um, a number of values that underpin the way we want to be working. Um, first of all, I really believe, um, and, and I think the way we, sh we want to be doing this is by being invited in to support a need. Sometimes people say, I want to, to do something useful and go and do something. I think it's really important that the pool comes from the partner side. So Professor Awuku is a professor of medicine in Ghana, and he approached me a few years ago and said, I want to learn point of ultrasound, but I can't do that in Ghana. How do we do this? Where do I go? So we said, well, rather than you going somewhere else, why don't we try and set up a training program within Ghana uh, that will be accessible for general physicians um, in peripheral clinics in areas where access to routine radiology or sonography services might be restricted. So last year we ran our first program, our first pilot course, and you can see we had a lot of fun while it happened. Um, but I think that highlights the second point that I wanted to make, which is that this has to be, um, or I'm very pleased that it is an equitable sort of partnership, that we do this together um, this year on the course, last year's participants will be trainers. We will, we're evaluating the impact in their daily patient care together. You know, it, it, this is a joint effort, as it were, and I, I really feel that, that that's how this work should be done. And then the third point, I think, is that we have to listen very closely to what is the actual need on the ground. Our knowledge and experience when you have trained and work in a high income or high resourced setting, our experience is not always relevant or very often not relevant 
to what actually is the need on the ground. And I think the quote that Dr. Momade used here reflects that really nicely. The role of point of care ultrasound in low resource settings is a necessity and not a luxury. And for radiologists and sonographers, point of care ultrasound is sometimes quite controversial. But if you're in an environment where access, immediate or even you know, not immediate access to sonography services is so limited, it can make a real difference to a patient that somebody who sees them at the front door has that skill and that can help them in achieving a diagnosis. So the need is not maybe as we know the need to be, but we have to adapt um, and work on that need together. And then finally, this is a collaborative effort. It, it can't be one organization. And you can see on the banner behind, and I'll come to this a bit later as well. This is a joint effort between universities and us and clinicians. And between us, we are developing this program. So thank you to Dr. Mamade for presenting about the program and sharing the slide. And just to illustrate that in a clinical fashion, these images are from the Radiopedia website, but this is a true clinical case from Ghana. Um, a young woman who presents with a swollen leg, she's been referred from a peripheral clinic into an emergency department with the question, she's not responding to antibiotics, does she have a DVT? So now the clinician at the door who's had these skills training can scan for a DVT, exclude the DVT, then scan her pelvis because she has a swollen leg. So the next thing to do is, is there anything in the pelvis that may explain this? Identifies a large mass in the cervix and then has learned in this program to check for the hydronephrosis in the kidneys because that can really help you get an impression of the stage of a cervical cancer. So within 30 minutes at the front door, Simply by being able to scan DVT, pelvic mass, and hydronephrosis, the doctor now is able to say, very unfortunate, that rather than cellulitis not responding to antibiotics, this young woman actually has advanced cervical cancer. She doesn't have to stay in the ED to wait for access to the sonography services, which are very overwhelmed. The queues are at the door. Um, it may take days before you can get a formal scan. She doesn't have to be put on anticoagulants in the interim. They stop the antibiotics and she's referred for appropriate palliative care. Now, however sad this case may be, it is the reality and it's a reality that you need to know when you do this kind of work. And that's what I meant by understanding local pathology and, and local priorities and, and, and possibilities. because. Unfortunately, in West Africa, cervical cancer is the number one killer in cancer. And you can see this from the global cancer statistics. If you look at West Africa, the incidence of cervical cancer is very high and the mortality is high. Compare that to high income countries at the bottom where we've had screening programs going for years. There is good news in that the HPV vaccination should now, over time, make things better. But meanwhile, there are still many, many, many women presenting with advanced cervical cancer. So that brings me to the next um, piece of work that we're working on, which is providing in-country radiology support. So support for imaging services in-country through volunteering. And this is just one example of a senior radiology trainee from the UK who took time out of his training and spent a couple of months in the Gambia in a clinic um, where there is x-ray and there is ultrasound, but there is no radiologist. And again, lots of time spent with ultrasound because that is one of the key modalities here. Um, and interestingly said, you know, I learned a lot about the way the work works and I scanned more patients in five months than I did in the four years in my whole training previously. So there is a huge learning element and understanding of local context when you go out. Meanwhile, another 
example of being in a clinic, working with people there, is having the opportunity to help with quality improvement of existing services. We, we often think about, oh, we want to donate equipment or we want to in, install a patch solution. It takes millions of dollars to do that. We don't have the millions of dollars and a lot can be achieved by trying to improve quality within existing services. And this is an example where you can see the same x-ray machine, um, but just by tweaking the settings, this was um, a volunteer radiographer who worked with the local technician. And you can see that the same patient six months before had an x-ray, and then this is the current x-ray, and now the detail of abnormalities in the lungs is visible much more clearly. On this film, you might argue there's right apical atelectasis, upper lobe atelectasis. There are multiple soft tissue nodules in the left upper zone. Coming from, say, the UK where I sit, uh, you might think, oh dear, is this cancer? Are these lung metastases? But if you know that this film comes from an environment where tuberculosis is extremely common, and you now have a good quality x-ray that shows you all these tiny calcified nodules, it shows you that these nodules are very sharply defined and very dense. You can see some scarring. Put that all together and now it's much more likely that these are findings related to a previous episode of tuberculosis. So this is an example of how local knowledge combined with quality improvement of images can really help um, improve diagnostics. So going from supporting in-country support to remote support, this is something that I we often get questions from people saying, and I'd really love to help. Um, please, can you sign me up? I'll do some reporting. And that's fantastic. And we are working on that as, as I speak right now. Um, but it's not as straightforward as it sounds. We use remote reporting an awful lot now. Uh, we send images across the world. People, Lots of people are working from home doing extra reporting. But even here, sometimes there is a disconnect between what the reporter does and what the clinician knows about the patient because you don't have access to all the information. Now, when you're going to do this for, say, a country like the Gambia that we're talking about at the moment, there is also the disconnect between a common pathology on the ground, uh, what's available for treatment, and what, what I, as a remote, remote reporter in the UK, may know. So what we're looking at is to develop long-term relationships of volunteers who really get to know the clinicians, who take part in MDTs, such as the example here, who have an opportunity to communicate with clinicians and to develop their knowledge and skills and then maybe become involved in education, might like to go and spend some time on the ground. Somebody coined the phrase recently of like a sort of a virtual department so that you are connected into that department, even though the reporting you do may be from wherever you're sitting in the world. So we're hoping that we can really pull together the in-country support, the education and the remote reporting support. And also, I'd like to note that remote reporting, actually, most of this is MDT support, second opinion of complex cases. And we may be providing also primary reporting support, but that will always be as an adjunct to the existing team's capacity. We don't have the ambition to become a, a massive teleradiology service for all the reasons I just mentioned. I think that in this context, that could actually be, if, if not dangerous, at least unhelpful, because you really need to be well connected to the situation on the ground. And to illustrate that, I'm showing an image that came through this MDT. This is an MDT where um, the Gambian team is in the room and I'm sitting in the UK presenting these cases via a secure PAC solution because we also have to keep in mind that we are very conscious of not sending patient data 
on insecure platforms and therefore we should also not be doing that for patients from the Gambia, for example. It's really important to use secure solutions and keep patient confidentiality at the forefront of our minds. Anyway, so this case is a young woman who presents with, she's limping, she's got fever, it's fairly long term and there was actually concern that she might have a psoas abscess. So there was a pelvic and a spine x-ray taken, thinking she might have spondylodicitis, resulting in a psoas abscess. And actually the spine x-ray was normal. And at first look, you'd say, oh, this, you know, the pelvic x-ray and the hip x-ray was normal. But when you look closely, what you see here is that there's slight narrowing of the joint space and there is some subchondral lucency here in the acetabulum. With the limping, with knowing that she's in an environment where tuberculosis is common, she's got the symptoms that fit with TB, these findings are highly suggestive of tuberculosis in the hip joint. So again, an example of really working together with the clinical teams, understanding local um, disease incidents. And that brings me to the advocacy element. Um, I'm sitting here talking to you and I hope that it can inspire you and give you a bit of an insight into the work. Um, advocacy is also obviously about talking about the importance of imaging in achieving sustainable health goals. Um, but it's also, I think, a little bit about thinking how the radiology community projects itself and its work in the world. The image at the bottom is a picture of one of the RSNA conferences, and this is the exhibition hall, and many of you will have been to conferences like this. It's huge, it's high tech, everybody's always thinking about the next development, more CT slices, AI. It's a very high tech environment, and it's an environment that's very cost intensive. And I think Based on what we've seen just now, we all realise that much of that is completely out of reach of low income settings. And we have to be conscious that every time that we develop something that is more complex, it may actually become less available, it becomes more expensive, more difficult to do, and it actually has a negative impact on what you can do in a low resource environment. So I think it's really important that as a radiology community, we think about solutions that work for low income settings. So for example, develop a system where you, and I know companies are working on this, where rather than do a heavy capital investment in buying a CT scanner, you actually place the scanner there and you have a paper scan system. Uh, maintenance should be included rather than an add on um, there are lots of ways that we, as the imaging community, can think about facilitating the fact that if you have very small funds, that you have to do this differently. And also, I think the way we speak to policymakers and, and global institutions, I was really struck. The top line, these images, are from um, a WHO medical devices report. So this is a report about... Um, what's needed um, uh, for medical devices. And you can see it's about safety, it's about training. It, the devices have to be effective, they have to be innovative, they have to be of high quality. And the examples on the pictures are hearing aids, vaccinations, ECG, glasses. And suddenly there's this picture of this very high-end expensive scanner. And now, of course, one scanner can look after many patients, but still, I, I think it would be much more appropriate to have an image of a new portable X-ray generator or a low-cost ultrasound machine. And I think this is due to the fact that many people equate imaging with all this high-tech stuff. And yet, for low-resource settings, we're going to really have to focus on the affordable solutions. And with that, I would like to thank and acknowledge all the partners um, and people who are working with us to make this happen. 
like I said earlier, this, this can only work in partnership and we are extremely grateful to companies that are donating equipment, that are giving us grants, our academic partners, both in the UK, in Malawi, in Ghana, um, Collective Minds, who are providing us with the um, pack solution to share images, Fair Development, Charity Boost, organisations that are not profit, that help small charities like ours grow and develop. And I'm extremely excited about the next few years and how we are going to build this further. Um, if you'd like to know more, please visit our website. And if you'd like to contribute, uh, you can sign up to our newsletters um, where we will um, advertise opportunities. You can sign up through our website. And of course, if you'd like help to help us financially, that would be very much appreciated. And again, on our website, there is an option to donate. And very even small donations can make a real big difference. And just as an example, it costs no more than £10 to facilitate the transfer of an image for an expert in the UK to help review an image and to help the clinical team make a decision on how best to treat that patient. It's just one example, but any contribution and support will be really appreciated. And with that, I would like to, again, thank you for joining this session and thank you to Radiopedia.